Hey everyone, Pastor Cal here. It's my privilege to welcome you to our Sunday morning service today. Now whether you're here in person, you're watching our live stream, or watching at some other time, thank you for joining us. I pray that you'll be blessed as we join together to express our worship to God and as we invite God to join us and be with us. Before we get into things, can I ask you to just let us know that you've joined us? You can scan the QR code on the screen right now, or if you're in the building, there should be a welcome card in the seat pocket in front of you. You can either fill that welcome card out or the QR code is on that card as well. Now that code will take you to our kind of Ebenezer app where you can check in, you can send us any prayer requests, information requests or updates, and there are giving options there as well. Remember that giving is not only a part of our practice as a faith community, it's also our privilege as children of God. If you're here in person, you can also give at the coffee station after the service. Also, for those who are watching online, this morning we will be celebrating the Lord's Supper together. So take a moment to get your communion elements ready. A little bit of bread or a cracker and a small cup of juice will work just fine. Now a few announcements for us this week. First, I want to once again remind you about our journey wall in the hallway just outside the chapel. We're getting more and more entries and there's been pictures added as well. And it's great to just walk down that journey wall and look at what's up there and to recall the amazing memories of God's work in our church family over the last many years. Now, if you haven't yet added your memory or your memories, grab one of the forms and fill it out, hand it into the church office. And if you haven't yet had a chance to see what's up there, go and take a look. Maybe that'll remind you of some of the ways God has worked in your life through Ebenezer and you can add that to the memory wall as well. Remember, that this journey wall is a part of our succession plan as it allows us to recall where God has worked and guided us in the past. It allows us to better understand who we are as a church family in the present and will help guide us as we discern God's leading into the future. We want each and every one of you to be a part of this exercise. And so we look forward to your entries up on that wall. Second, mark March 13th on your calendars, next Sunday. On that Sunday evening at 6.30 p.m., we're going to have a night of worship and prayer. Now, this is a time we've set aside for us to come together as a family simply to worship God. In the busyness of our lives, it's important that we regularly take time to reflect and respond to God, His nature and His characters, and of course, His awesome work. So come together as a family, come as an individual, come as a life group, whatever. It's going to be a great time and we look forward to seeing you there. And finally, on Sunday, April 3rd, we'll be having a newcomers class as well as a baptism class. If you consider yourself newer to the Ebenezer family, then plan to join the newcomers class and find out more about who we are and our vision, our staff, so on. And if God has been speaking to you about getting baptized, plan on attending the baptism class. More information, the exact times and, uh, and rooms that th these classes will be in will be coming in the weeks to come. I think that's all the announcements for now. Keep an eye on the slides that come before and after the service for other events and happenings uh, that are throughout the Ebenezer family during the week. I'm looking forward to a great time together this morning as Pastor Layton introduces our new sermon series in 2 Peter we've titled Unshakable, and as Pastor Chet leads us in worship and song. So let's stand together now and join Pastor Chet and the worship team. Have a great morning. There's nothing good in me. You are love, you are love on display for all to see. You are light, you are light when the darkness closes in. You are hope, you are hope. You have covered all my sin. You are peace, you are peace when my fear is crippling. Light up 
happening in the world around us, that you never change, your character never fails, your promises are always true. And God, we cast ourselves towards you as a broken and finite people, uh, and we cling to you, the one who never changes, our rock. A refuge and, and God in a world that we live in right now with everything that is happening in our own country and around the world and and uh, the war that is going on and whether it's uh, that or it is in our own worlds with what's happening in our emotions and our mind God it is good to know that you never change and it's in seasons like this and moments like this that it's important for us to align ourselves to who you are, what you accomplished on the cross on our behalf, and attach ourselves to your character. We need that. And God, I pray that as we reflect on that in these next couple of songs and are just reminded of that, that at the same time that we're going, we need you that your heart would be filled with your creation who acknowledges you and, and, uh, and is, is going, we love you for who you are. May your heart be blessed and filled. We pray this in your name. Father everlasting, the all-creating one, God Almighty, through your Holy Spirit, conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus 
the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one, I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again, for I believe in the name of Jesus. Defender, suffered and crucified. Forgiveness is in you. Descended into darkness, you rose in glorious light. Forever seated high. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. And I
Thank you, worship team, for once again leading us just into the presence of God. It is good to be here, gathered together in the presence of God, isn't it? Amen? Oh, we got a few ameners. That's great. <laughs> uh, just want to welcome you here this morning, and that includes those of you that are joining us online. We just, uh, we just find it such a privilege to be able to meet in a variety of ways and and just united in um, coming to worship God and be in his presence. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Grace, and I'm on the pastoral team here at Ebenezer. And before I lead us in prayer, I just want to thank you for your prayers this past week as our staff um, went off site for a few days and just spent some time praying and seeking God's direction for our church family and for us even personally. And so uh, we really need your prayers, your ongoing prayers for us. And so thank you for those of you that, that really had us in your prayers this past week. Would you join me in, in prayer as, as I lead us together? Our Father in heaven, we reverence and honor your name this morning. We recognize that you alone are the answer for the brokenness of our world and for each day that we, we live uh, for you. Because as we sang this morning already, you are wisdom and you are hope, you are, you are just, you are truth, you are light, you are peace, you are joy, and most of all, you are love. And Father, because of the fact that you first loved us, we ask, Father, that you would renew our love for you. That we would seek you first above all things. And, Father, we confess that we are easily distracted by the things of this world. And we don't always give you first place in our lives to make you master and Lord in every area of our lives. Because, Father, we recognize that you alone have the answers, not just for eternal life, but for each day that we live. Help us to recognize the emptiness of all other pursuits that keep us from having that intimate relationship with you. Jesus, you showed us a better way to live our lives. Help us to follow... Um, Jesus's ways and to be like you in character because that is the way that leads to true life. John 10.10 10, uh, says that Jesus came not only to give us eternal life but that each day here on earth would be abundant with meaning and joy and purpose. So Holy Spirit we bring us back to the heart and mission of God to seek you with all our hearts. This morning, we are also very mindful of the people of Ukraine, and our hearts are heavy for them. Father, we believe that you are sovereign in all things and all places, and we believe that for Ukraine as well. You have promised to hear from heaven, and that you will lean down and listen when we pray. 
And so we ask for strength and safety for our brothers and sisters in Ukraine. We ask, Father, that evil will be overcome with good and for your glory. And for the Ukrainian community in our city and here even at Ebenezer, we pray your peace over them. We pray with them for an end to this awful war. Help us to stand with them as they grieve for their homeland and for the family that they still have there. Show us how to be the family of God to these brothers and sisters during this time. And for others um, in our midst who are struggling with, with health, um, perhaps grieving, financial or relationship stress or loss, Father, we ask that you would, they would feel your presence and peace. And as you're the family of God, give us eyes to see ways that we can walk with them in these difficult times. And give us the love for each other that will respond to the needs that we see. Thank you for where we see evidence of your spirit at work in our individual lives and in our church family. Thank you for not giving up on us even when our hearts are distracted or divided or have even grown cold. Give us the courage, Father, and the humility to pray as, as David did. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of right living. Father, as Pastor Layton comes to share from your word this morning, we ask that you would anoint him with your spirit. And I pray that you would um, help us to he not just hear your word, but to be willing to obey it as well. We ask all these things in the powerful and beautiful name of Jesus. Amen. If you are age four to grade four, you are dismissed to go to Rush. If you're new here, just go to the back of the room and follow all the little footsteps that are going. Someone will be helping you there. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Grace, for that prayer. Uh, it's great to see everyone here today. It's great to see your faces. For some of you, I'm looking at your face for the very first time. I've seen you with masks on. And uh, I hope you don't say to me, uh, like someone else did this morning, uh, you look better with a mask on late and maybe you should put it back. <laughs> that was hurtful, but uh, I've, I've learned forgiveness, so I'm okay with that. So I want to begin today with an announcement. I want to update you on our, our search for a youth pastor. And uh, we began this, this journey uh, in September. We, we put out the word and began actively re recruiting people in November and received several app applications. Then in January, we assembled a team of people, and that included uh, staff members, board members, and some parents from our church family here. And we looked over the applicants, and then in February, we did some interviews, and I think we conducted three interviews in total, and we decided that uh, two of those people really stood out, and to the, to the point where actually we had uh, a, a lot of trouble deciding on who to actually pursue uh, because they were, they were equally good, just in different ways. Uh, they were very, something that we thought was, was very good for us here as a, as a, as a uh, church here. So um, what we ended up deciding to do is to pursue both of them. <laughs> and so we are looking at um, uh, bringing out on a, uh, a guy and also a girl who are recent graduates from Briarcrest Bible College. In fact, they know each other, they have a common best friend. One is engaged to that best friend, and the other one is, of course, just a friend of that person. And so it's, it's great to have them. So I, I wanna just introduce who they're going to be. Uh, one person you will know because they're from our church family, the other person's gonna be new to you. But the first person is Will Dimitro. Will has, has been our, our intern here this last year. He is part of our church family. He has a passion for youth. He's grown up in the youth. And, uh, and he, is, he is very excited about being part of this, uh, this journey, and so we're grateful for that. Uh, and of course, we had to approach both of them and ask them if they'd be open to working together, and they were. And the other person is Ashlyn Feenstra, and Ashlyn is from, uh, she's from Lethbridge, Alberta, and uh, we're excited that she's gonna be here. Both have some tremendous gifts. And what made this possible is that uh, Ashlyn also has some background in children's ministry, 
uh, both in a training and also an experience. And because we have some, some needs in that area right now, uh, we thought this would be a great opportunity to, to explore something different. And so we're going to invite them to come and candidate at our church. That's going to happen on uh, March 22nd all the way to the 27th. So there'll be a couple of connecting points with the youth and parents and the, the church family on the Sunday morning. We want you to get to know them, and we want to be able to vote and hopefully call them and, and invite them to be part of our, our staff team here. So I'm very excited about this. These are, these are high-quality people. I was talking to our executive director of our denomination. I called him a couple times to see if he had any people uh, in mind for us, and he said to me, uh, boy, youth pastors right now, they're like unicorns. They're hard to find. And, and so the fact that we have two people that are interested in being part of our family here is exceptional. And I hope that encourages uh, the families that are here and the youth. I, I can tell you that uh, for those that don't know Ashlyn, you're going to fall in love with her because she is, uh, she is amazing, wonderful, loves relationships. I think she, she's going to help us, you know, we're going to go long and deep with her in terms of discipleship. And, and Will, is Will here today? I think he is. Where's Will? Okay. <laughs> Will, you want to just stand up here? Uh, this, is, this is like, you know, the Energizer Bunny? This is like the Energizer Bunny on steroids. Like, he's just, he is, he's got energy galore. And so we're excited about that. And, Will, we're looking forward to having you uh, come out and, and for the candidating process. Okay, so with that, I want to move on to my sermon today. And uh, we are going to, this morning, begin a new sermon series to the book of Second Peter that we're calling Unshakable. Now, originally, we planned to teach this, this series this past fall as a follow-up to our series on 1 Peter, which happened in the springtime. But the lifting of COVID regulations at the end of summer shifted our plans, and we just felt we needed to do something to draw us back together again. And so we did a series called Taste of the Gain, and then we followed that up with a series, series on Hearing God. But now we're finally here. We're back to 2 Peter, and so here's what I want to accomplish this morning as we kick this off. I first of all want to introduce this series to you and give you enough of a picture of what's to come in the next few weeks that you'll be wanting to come back and take it all in. It's going to be a great series. I want to introduce uh, the book of Second Peter to you and put it in its proper context this morning so that we can glean the most from the letter as we look at things. And then I want to lead you through just the opening few verses, the introduction, uh, as a way for us to draw out a few truths that can encourage us and strengthen us even today. So first, let me set up the, the uh, series for you. Uh, this past week, as Grace mentioned, our staff team went out to Camp Kinesale in Christopher Lake for a strategic planning re retreat. And, and one of the exercises that we did was to just to, just to pause and, and reflect over the last couple of years on all that's happened in our lives, personally, on our, on, on our church, in the country, and, and just, uh, just to kind of consider and, and just pause on what's all happened, because there's been tons. And we came up with a, with a list that would probably be your list as well, but you know, on top of, the, of course, the global pandemic and all the implications there, the government restrictions that have impacted us, the economic challenges for some people and some businesses, the disruption of social structures in, in our home and in the church and in other places, uh, health challenges that, that hit us during that time, uh, the relational isolation that held us back, and some of you felt that more than others, the extreme stressors in our lives, especially in, this, in the social sector and service providers with health care. It was, it was a huge, huge stressor in people's lives. And then, of course, in the midst of all that, you remember... Black Lives Matter, and then there was Every Child Matters, and then the Freedom Rallies, and the division that we sensed as a country, and even in families and churches. And then most recently, of course, the, the unprovoked invasion of Ukraine, which I don't know how you're responding to it. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm deeply disturbed by what's happening. And uh, yesterday I went downstairs, and my wife was watching a news story that she recorded on, online, and she was just She's just bawling as she's watching these families being displaced. And, and we're looking at these young moms, and it could be our kids and our grandkids, and it's devastating. And so if this hasn't touched your heart, uh, you, you need to let it and to pray for it. And, and, the, all, and then the global tension around this. And so it just creates this, this, this deep uncertainty around us and this kind of this dizzying effect of all that's happening around the world. At least that's how I'm feeling. And, uh, you know, we've had a tough couple of years. 
And I think it's okay for us just to acknowledge some of those challenges that we've encountered. It's okay to, to name some of the disappointments and hurts that we've experienced during this last couple of years. It, it's okay to grieve over the things that we've lost because we have, we have lost things and there's much you know, to grieve about. And, you know, truly these are challenging and disorienting times. Now, one phrase I've heard that maybe you've heard as well is, is the phrase, a cultural moment. This is where, where all these things come together and it creates an opportunity for us to respond to something that's happening around us. And they're calling that a cultural moment. And, and certainly there's been lots of things happening around us that, that this is a cultural moment for the nation. It's a cultural moment for the church, even as we respond to the war in Ukraine. Now, um, although the details are different, the Apostle Paul wrote to the people, to people facing similar challenges. Uh, he sent a couple of letters to Christians across five diverse regions who are experiencing this dizzying effect of cultural disorientation. And the churches of Asia Minor were not just struggling with persecution and suffering uh, that Peter addressed in his first letter. They're also facing strife and dissension in their own ranks. And in an effort to, to, to stem this, this tide of heresy and false teaching among the Christians, Peter wrote the Christians of his day about the importance of us leaning in and clinging to uh, a proper understanding of the gospel and a proper understanding of God. And this is a message that actually rings true today. It's relevant for us. It's timely for us because we're all facing these challenges. Now, what we're going to see, though, uh, as we open up 2 Peter, and as difficult as these times are, and I want you to catch this statement, cultural disorientation is an opportunity to recenter hope. Uh, let me just say that again, because I think it's important, that in times where everything around us is just spinning out of control, and we're trying to grab anything that has any kind of foundation, this is the time, this is the moment for us to be able to, to recenter ourselves on things that matter most. And in our world today, there are people that even in all that's happening around us, they're still not clinging to or looking at the, the Bible and the ways of God as that foundation for things. And Peter's going to encourage us that this is actually the, the heartbeat, the thing that will center us, the thing that will anchor us along the way. So Second Peter. You may recall from our series in 1 Peter back in April, because I know that you cling to all of our words and listen carefully and remember everything that we say from the frontier, but you may remember that, that Peter wrote uh, his first letter to believers who have been scattered across the Middle East at the very beginning of Nero's reign of terror, which began in about AD 64. And in this, and in this first letter, the purpose was to, to encourage the church in the suffering that they were facing with these words of hope. Now, uh, Peter's second letter is written about two or three years later, around A.D. 67, and this was now at the height of Nero's terror of reign. And in fact, uh, it was during this season or time that both Peter and Paul were put to death by Nero. Uh, tradition tells us that, P that Paul was, was beheaded by Nero and that Peter was crucified upside down. So there was an intensity that was happening around this time that Peter was, was, was feeling. And it, and it seems like from the verses in about uh, 13 and 15 of chapter 1 that, that he realized that his death was going to be imminent. And so he writes this letter really knowing that these are going to be his last words to the people he loves, the church he loves. And that's why this is known as Peter's farewell sermon. And this time, though, he doesn't focus in on the suffering, even though it's more intense than ever. Instead, he focuses in on the church's internal problems. And in particular, he zeroes in on the false teachers who are, have made their way into the church and were leading the church astray. Now, with, with his last words, Peter wanted to remind all believers to just to never stop growing, to keep on leaning into God and leaning into the, the foundations of the gospel because he knew how easy it would be for followers of Christ to drift, drift away from the fundamentals of the gospel, especially when they're going through tough times, and especially when, when false teachers are infiltrating them. And in Peter's day, these false teachers were causing people to doubt their faith and turn away from Christianity through their corrupt way of living, 
and also through their distorted theology. And by the way, this is still a huge issue for the church today. We see some religious leaders whose, whose lifestyle is not becoming of what the Bible says, and we see all sorts of different theologies out there that are pulling us apart. Now, did you realize that there are actually about 10,000 active cult, cults around the world today? And that doesn't include some of the false teachers that have infiltrated the church of the 21st century. Now, much of Peter's uh, second letter is about, is about knowing and staying focused on the essentials of faith so that believers would not drift into heretical teaching. And he wanted the church to be, to be rooted in the truth of the gospel and understand it more and more fully because we can never fully understand the ways of God and the work of God. Now, before we, we open uh, to the first verses in this uh, book, let me just give you a quick overview of Second Peter. It's a short book. It's only three chapters long, which means that, that uh, you, could, you could go home this afternoon and quickly read it so you're on, on top of everything that we're going to be teaching over the next few weeks. But in, in chapter 1, we're going to see that, the, that uh, Peter talks about the basics of the gospel and how to grow as a Christian. And he emphasizes the, the sufficiency and the certainty of God's word in our lives. Now, the second chapter, we're going to see that, that he outlines the nature and the, and the uh, danger of false prophets amongst, and false teachers. And then in chapter 3, he's going to speak of the certainty of Christ's return. And he picks this one in particular because this is one of the things that the heretical teachers were saying was not going to happen. And so back then, they were saying you know, to the people, hey, listen, there's no second coming. Jesus is not going to return. And so therefore, because he's not going to return, there's not going to be any judgment over you. And so therefore, you can live your life however you want to. Now, if that sounds familiar, it should, because that is the dominant message of North America, including some churches in North America. Okay, so now... With that introduction, let's look at verses 1 and 2 of chapter 1. It'll appear on the screen, but if you have your device or Bible, I'd encourage you to open it up. Now, I'm going to be reading from the uh, ESV version today, and this is what it says. Uh, Simeon, Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to whom have obtained, to whom, to, to, who, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Okay, so let me just stop there. So we can tell from the very first verse that the author here is Peter. And they use the phrase Simeon Peter, which is different from the other letters. Now, your version might have it different, but there might be a little jot note there as well. Uh, Simeon, uh, some people say that it's not really Peter that wrote this because it's a different first name. But Simeon is just the Jewish version of Simon. And Peter is the name that, that, God, or that Jesus gave uh, Simon. So, now most of you will probably know who Simon Peter is, but for those who don't, he was one of the original 12 disciples. His original profession was a fisherman until Jesus called him out of that to become a fisher of men. Uh, he was a, a rough guy, he was a tough guy, he was outspoken, he was impulsive, got himself in trouble lots with his mouth. Uh, he's the one, though, that was the first to recognize who Jesus Christ really was that he was the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus affirmed him for that. And Peter was also the first one to deny Christ after Jesus went to the cross. But by God's great mercy, Peter became this great leader in the early church. He became this fearless servant of his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And because of that, uh, Jesus gave him the name Cephas, which means rock. A name that actually was a, was a testimony of God's transforming power in, in Peter's life. I want you to notice, though, how, how Peter referred to himself in this. His first word to use for himself, he says, uh, Simon Peter, a servant. He identified himself first as a servant, although he was much more in the eyes of the church at that time. And this is, um, this is how Jesus Christ also led he saw himself as not coming to lead and lord over people, but to be a servant to people. And that's how Peter identifies himself. He also uses the, the term 
an apostle of Jesus Christ. And I don't think that's meant to brag about who he is. That's stating to the people that are reading this letter that he has an apostle, a, 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 apostolic authority, that God's hands upon him. Paul, Paul also did that often. He would talk about being an apostle to give him credibility that the words he's saying are actually not just human words, but they're coming from God. So, the audience. I mentioned this already, but the, he's writing to the same people he wrote to in the first letter. They were persecuted Christians scattered throughout modern-day Turkey. But he also adds a line, and this is what he says, to those who obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our, our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, Peter was predominantly writing to a non-Jewish audience, and he was reminding them that followers of Jesus have an equal standing before God. There, there are no first-class Christians. There are no second-class class, uh, Christians. Our standing comes not based on our righteousness, not based on our ethnicity, not based on our position in the church, but simply and fully on the righteousness of God and his work in our lives. You know, someone said that when we come to the cross, when we arrive at the foot of the cross, as we're going to today as we celebrate the Lord's Supper together, that we come together as equals. No one else has more standing than anyone else. We come as people desperately needing a Savior and desperately needing the work of Jesus in our lives. Verse 2, it continues. It says this, May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord. Uh, this very phrase, at least the first part of it, appeared in Peter's first letter. But he adds the phrase, in the knowledge of God and Jesus Christ. In fact, he actually bookends the whole letter with, with that phrase, in the knowledge of God. Uh, verse 2, uh, May grace be multiplied in you in the knowledge of God and of, our Jesus, and of Jesus our Lord. And then verse, chapter 3, verse 18, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, that is going to be a major theme throughout the whole short letter. The word knowledge appears 11 times in these three short chapters. And, and it's so Paul or Peter wants us to notice that. He wants us to, to, his audience to see, just as I want us to see today, that how knowing God is central to our faith. And when I say knowing God, I'm not just saying knowing facts about God, of course, or knowing the Bible or knowing that there is a God. It means that you lean into him and you know him through your experience and you dig deep to find out more and more about him because none of us can exhaust our knowledge of, of who God is. Now, J.I. Packer, some of you would recognize that author, he wrote a classic book called Knowing God. It was something I read back in Bible school. And, and this is what he says about knowing God. He says, what were we made for? To know God. What aim shall we set ourselves in life to know God? What is the eternal life that Jesus gives? It's the knowledge of God. What is the best thing in life bringing more joy and delight and contentment than anything else? It's the knowledge of God. Now, not everyone believes that, but that's the truth. And then he adds, he concludes, uh, once you have become aware that your main business in life is to know God, most of your problems will fall into place. Interesting. Now just think of how that would change you and your attitude and perspective on life. If, if you were to wake up tomorrow believing in your heart and your mind that your main business today would be to know God, that you would see him in all the things that happen around you, those frustrating moments, those blessings, when you open up God's word, when you pray, and God is just pouring out himself and saying, I just want you to know me more and more and more. It would change your life. It would change how you move through life. So uh, let's keep that in mind, because that's one of the themes as we, as we walk through Second Peter together over the next few weeks. And let's actually pray for each other, that, that we would be people that would lean in and that we would long for uh, uh, and desire to know God more and more and deeper and deeper, and that God would open our eyes and open our hearts that we might do that. Now, Peter continues in uh, verses 3 and 4, and this is what he says. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness 
through the knowledge of him who has called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of, the sinful, of your sinful desire. Now these two verses uh, introduce the whole next section of the letter, which actually goes all the way down to verse 11. And I'm only going to look at these two verses right now as the intro, and then Pastor Kelly's going to come back next week, and he's going to look at verses 5 through 11 and dig into that a bit deeper. But in verses 3 and 4, Peter names the privileges that we have as followers of Christ. And then in verses 5 to 11, he exhorts us to grow in, and mature in this godly, godliness. Now, there are three words I want you to notice in verses 3 and 4. And here's what they are. Uh, they are power, and they are promises, and they are partakers. And we're going to look at those in, in a bit more detail. And I just want to mention that, that uh, there's a pastor I like to listen to named Tony Murata, and, uh, and he had a great sermon on this, and so some of these next points I, I'm drawing from, from the sermon I heard from him. Um, so first of all, uh, power. We have God's power as God's children. His divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness, to the knowledge of him who called us into his own glory and excellence. You see, God has provided everything believers need for life and godliness. Everything that we need. You know, this wonderful truth is part of our salvation, that everything we need has been given by God in our conversion. You and I, we are lacking nothing, nothing for life and godliness, even though sometimes it feels like we are. And his divine power has granted us all things to pertain to life and godliness. We have all the re resources we need, to, uh, need for the goal of godliness. Now, two questions come to mind as I look at that passage. And the first question is, is, is one that I think we, we actually need to ask ourselves in this text. And that is simply this. Is, is godliness my goal? You know, do I, do I even desire godliness? Like, is godliness your goal? Do you even desire godliness? Because some of us don't, right? Some of us, we're content living our life kind of coasting through or, or dabbling into Christianity or dabbling into the world's ways, and we don't, don't really want to change to be this godly person, so we're not really leaning into that. And that's the first question we need to ask. But if we are, if you're sitting here and going, you know what, the deepest longing of my heart is that I would, I would walk in, in godly rhythm with, with, with my Savior, that he would help me to be this, this changed, godly person. Because if that is you, then this verse is a tremendous encouragement to us. It's, it's telling us that the pursuit of godliness in our life is not this hopeless, futile exercise. You know, the battle against sin that we're facing and struggling with is not futile. There's, there's, a, there's a, a, a hope that we're going to overcome this. And the battle against the invisible enemy that we talked about in the last series is something that can be won. Because God gives us everything, everything we need for life and godliness. You know, he doesn't pursue us. He doesn't call us to, be his, into, call us to come into his family and save us, <laughs> excuse me, through that path of destruction that we're on, and then just kind of say, well, you know, good luck to you. I hope you make it. No, no, he wants us to make it. He wants us to live these godly lives, and he's given us everything that we need. And so that leads me to the second question in this text, which is, well, what, what then is the divine power that God has given us? He says we have it. What is it? Well, I think it's two things. And the first thing is uh, simply the indwelling of his spirit. That is, the indwelling of a spirit gives us the power to say no to sin and yes to God. Now, we don't need uh, to go to someone else. We don't need to go to something else. We don't need to go, go somewhere else to find the key to the Christian life. We have it, and it's the Spirit of God living inside of us. And God has given to us Him to us freely and willingly. It's His gift of grace to us. Now let me just read a couple of uh, <laughs> excuse me, passages of Scripture here. Ephesians 1.13, and, and this is what it says. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, 
the gospel of your salvation. And when you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing your inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. You see, what this passage is telling us is that the moment you become a follower of Christ, that God gives you his Holy Spirit, that Holy Spirit indwells you, and that's the promise that's going to guarantee your inheritance. And it's the hope that you're going to become a changed person. John 14 uh, tells more about the Spirit's power in our lives, and it says this, I will ask the Father, this is Jesus speaking, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. An advocate is someone who comes alongside us, and that he's going to come alongside us forever, and that is the Spirit of truth, it says. And then John 16, it goes on to say, uh, but again, Jesus is speaking, but very truly I tell you, it's for your good that I go away, because unless I go away, the advocate will not come. But if I go, I will send him to you, and, he will, and when he comes, he will prove the world to be wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. And then it, later in verse 13 it says, And when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, and he will tell you what is yet to come. You see, he gives us the Spirit, and that Spirit gives us what we need for a life of godliness. But he gives us something else too. He gives us his divine power uh, in his living word. Uh, 2 Timothy 3. This is a letter that Paul is writing. And Paul and Peter have some similar themes. And so they're both concerned about the church. They're both concerned about um, being, people being pulled away from the family of God and chasing after other things. They both uh, face persecution. They both died around the same time. So the, there's some similarities here. And this is what, what Paul says in 2 Timothy. He says, uh, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus is going to be persecuted. Then when we want to move down that path, that's what's going to happen. And, you know, I, I think that even though we've experienced some of that in our country right now, it's only going to intensify. I, I don't think that, that uh, you know, the church is going to experience, we're going to experience some more persecution along the way. Whether that is like the conversion therapy by law that's been passed or whether that's Bill C-10 that's trying to limit uh, freedom of speech. There's going to be more things that are coming our way. And it goes on to say that, um, but as for you, continue to live. He's speaking to Timothy. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have been con become convinced of because you know of whom you've learned it, which is Paul. And how from infancy you have made known the holy scriptures which make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. And then he adds a verse that many of you will, will recognize as soon as I read it. And it says this, All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. You see, his divine power has given us the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And his divine power has given us the powerful living word of God. Second word, uh, promises. We have God's promises. Uh, verse 4. It says, by which he has granted us his precious and very great promises. So, specifically, um, the great and glorious promises God has given us are, are, are from Jesus Christ. And Peter is saying to all believers that by virtue of being a Christian... We have not only received promises, but we're experiencing promises ourselves, and we will still experience promises that are yet to be fulfilled. And those promises go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, where, first, where God first promised to send one who would crush the head of the serpent. And those promises continued uh, as he made them to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the fathers of our faith, and then to Moses and Joshua and the nation of Israel, as he led them out of captivity, even as a sign for us that we can be led out of captivity. And those promises that he made to Samuel and David and Daniel, people who served him and who God blessed as a result. And the promises that he made to the disciples and to you and I as we read his word. And many of those promises have been fulfilled. Like the promise of true and complete forgiveness of sin because of Jesus shed blood. Because remember in the Old Testament times, that was never true and complete. It was always temporary. But now there's a new promise in Jesus that's been fulfilled. Or the promise of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, which we already just talked about. 
And some things um, have yet to be fulfilled. Like, for example, uh, like the promise of being in heaven, in heaven with him. That's not fulfilled yet for us, unless Jesus comes today or until he comes to take us home. But Peter wants us to know that the God of the Bible and the God of Israel is a promise maker and a promise keeper. He is a promise making God and a promise keeping God. And we've inherited all these glorious promises. Now the one in particular that, that, that Peter has in mind here is concerning the, the second coming of Christ. And it's based on, on three references in chapter 3 that talk about uh, there's, a, there's people questioning whether the, the promises that he's going to come again. And then Jesus himself says, that, or Peter says, that God's not slow in filling his promises. He's, he's doing that so that people can find repentance. In other words, he, he's being faithful in holding off his promise so that people like you and I can find a hope in him. And he talks about fulfilling his promise in, in verse 9 later on. And, and the false teachers that day were denying that. And Peter was saying here that we are a people that have inherited these promises. We're a people that are experiencing these promises and we can look forward to more promises being fulfilled. Especially the promise of Jesus Christ coming again. And by the way, that promise is the blessed hope. That's the promise that we're looking forward to. Not the end of restrictions or the return to normal. Uh, because in normal, um, normal is not our blessed hope. Returning to normal means there's still going to be death, there's still going to be injustices, there's still going to be sin, there's still going to be wars and conflict. But when Jesus comes again to, us, to usher in the new kingdom with himself as the good and righteous and just king, he's going to come and bring a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells again, where there'll be no more death, where Satan's rule over this earth will end and be conquered, where wars will cease, there won't be any more blood spilled in the street, there won't be any more sickness, and everything that was wrong will be made right. And that's the promise that we look forward to. And that's the blessed hope. And Peter, in his farewell sermon, exhorts us to remember that these, that, that, uh, to cling to these precious promises because they will help uh, keep us in, in line with him. And I want to say that, that God's promises are never empty. Every word that God says is going to be proven true. So we have everything we need for life and godliness. We have God's power, and we have God's promises. And lastly, we have, uh, we're partakers in the divine nature. So verse 4, it says, um, So that through them you, be, you may become partakers in the divine nature. Peter next tells us that these promises, uh, that is believing in them and trusting in Christ, uh, will, will help bring those things about. And we become something, we become partakers in a divine nature. In other words, that means that, that we share or that we participate in God's nature. Now, I hope you realize that, that our nature actually determines who we are. You know, for example, last week when we went out to Christopher Lake, I saw some signs of elk just outside my cabin. Uh, an elk happened to pass by late at night and was kind enough to leave a, a few recognizable things for me to look at, and so I, I knew that they were there. And now, of course, uh, elk and humans are very different. They're able to survive outside in minus temperatures. We're not able to do that. They, they sleep during the day and wander at night. We are the opposite. You know, so our nature determines who we are and what we do. And Peter reminds us that we're partakers in God's divine nature. And that ultimately should determine who we are and what we do if we're children of God. He made us, uh, God made us in, in his physical likeness, even though that's, that was marred by our sinful nature. In conversion, he made us into a new creation in Christ, where that image of God was again restored and renewed in us. And one day it says we're going, to, we're going to fully participate in God's divine nature. Now, um, in the second half of the verse, Peter mentions something else. He says, having escaped from corruption, that is, the world because of sinful desire. And so, in other words, the sinful nature is still there with us. Peter's not saying that because uh, we, are, we are, are participating or partaking in the divine nature 
that we're not going to sin anymore. But it means that as Christians, we have a new relationship to that sin. It means that that sin no longer has power over us like it once did. Now, even though we're not going to fully be free from sin and won't be on this earth, sin no longer has to have dominion over us. So his divine power has given us everything that we need for life and godliness, which means that we are not hopeless people when it comes to grow in godliness. We're not powerless people when it comes to walking with him. And it means that we've escaped the corruption of this world through our sinful desire. And this is great news for us. Now, I want to invite Chet to come up uh, right now and the team. And they're going to lead us in a song, and uh, we're going to have communion together. But just as he's doing that, let me just kind of wrap things up with a few summary comments to kind of pull things together. And um, what we've talked about here is some basic truths. And one of them is that the Christian life needs to center on Jesus. Everything in this passage that we talked about, that we looked at today, is either in or through or for Jesus Christ. And the reason that's so important uh, to keep Christ center is because our tendency is to drift away and to chase after other teachings. And so Peter says, listen, I need you to lean into Jesus. I need you to make him first and center your life on him. Second thing we've said is the Christian life is a gift of grace. Our assurance and our security is not in keeping our promises to God, but it's him keeping his promises to us. Third, the Christian life involves both word and spirit. We need God's word and we need God's spirit to be alive in our lives so that we can walk with him. And then fourth, it's just a reminder that the Christian life is an already not yet reality. In other words, we're partakers in this glorious salvation and it's true and, and real, but we don't, we're not gonna experience it yet in its fullness, but one day we will. So let me just uh, pray and then we're, gonna, we're going to move into communion. So Father, uh, thank you so much for your word. We are grateful for the promises that you've made and the promises that you've kept and the promises that are still awaiting for us. And thank you, Jesus, that we have a standing before our God through you and your righteousness and all that you've done on the cross. And it's your death and resurrection and your return that we, we ponder as we come to the table today. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would, please, uh, you should have received a cup when you came into the worship center today. And if not, there might be some people that will hand these out if they can. Does anybody need a communion cup? A few people? If I can have some staff, maybe you run to the back and, and bring some in for us, that would be great. So just, if you could take off the top layer, and just as, if, if you need one, just please raise your hand and we'll make sure. Chris, there's a couple over here in the middle here, if you could do that for me. <laughs> and just as we're waiting, I'd like you to take out the, the wafer and, and just hold it in your hands for a second. Some more people over here too, please. I shared this um, on a retreat and also first service. Um, about a month ago, I had a chance to go visit my mother, who's a wonderful Christian lady, but, but who's aging and declining. And she's now in a, in, a, in a home. She's lost her mobility. She can't get out to church. And I thought, you know, it's great to have these things like this. Now they don't leak in your pocket anymore. So I took one with me, and I says, Mom, can I lead you in a time of communion? And, and she, was, she was very excited. It was, my, my wife got a picture of us sharing communion together, just, just these two people, and, and uh, reading the scripture. And I know that my mom felt like she was, she was part of the family again, that this, was, this is the thing that, that binds us together. It's not our denominational background. It's not our gender or looks. It's, it's Jesus Christ and his work on the cross. And so just look at this uh, today, this wafer, which symbolizes Christ's broken body. And think about, what does this mean to you? What does Christ's broken body mean to you? Because the truth is, is that Jesus went to the cross and he suffered and his skin is broken from the whips. And he did that because he wanted to show you and prove to you that he loved you. And that should make you deeply grateful. It says in the scriptures, in Matthew chapter 26, 
that while they were eating, Jesus took bread and gave thanks and broke it. And he gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Let's eat this together. Okay, now if you can open the second layer as well. With these new cups, it sounds like a rainstorm in here. It's quite just a nice spring rain, right? No more snow, just, just a little bit of rain. Again, I want you to hold this up because this represents Christ's shed blood. And the scripture tells us without the, shedding, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. So what does this mean to you? Remember, in the Old Testament, people have to come back time and time again to have their sins temporarily covered when they brought a goat or a ram or a lamb. But when Jesus Christ died on the cross, his blood was sufficient for all people for all time to cover our sin. Does that make you think thankful and grateful for who Jesus Christ is? It says, Then they took a cup and they gave thanks and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, spilled for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Let's drink together. Okay, as we close the service today, I would like you to stand with me, please. And uh, Pastor Chet's going to lead us in, in one more song. Uh, if you're new to us or you haven't been here for a while, uh, this is the time where we create space to be able to pray for one another. And so there will be some leaders from the church that will be up at the front that would be happy to pray for you. Um, as well, if you know Jesus Christ is your Savior, in the eyes of God, you're a saint, you're, you're, and uh, you're righteous. And, and the Bible says that the, the, the prayers of a righteous person availeth much. And so maybe you just need to pause and, and go to the person beside you or, or lean over and pray for them as well. But we're going to sing this song together. And as we do, we we'll just invite you to pray for one another or to come up and be prayed for. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night Then through the darkness Your loving kindness Tore through the shadows of my soul The work is finished The end is written Jesus Christ, my living hope How could it so great a mercy, what heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has
benediction and let me remind you and invite you that next Sunday we're going to add a service. It's called the Now Service Night of Worship. It's going to start at uh, 6.30 p.m. Uh, right here in the worship center. We're going to put energy into this and we want to be able to worship God together like we just did right now. We want to be able to pray for each other which we desperately need. So I invite you to join us for that. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory and majesty, dominion and authority before all time and now and forevermore. Amen. So would you go today realizing that, that God has given you everything you need for life and godliness for this week and beyond. And may you live in that power. May you lean into his spirit and his word as you listen to him. And go with joy and also greet each other with a smile today in a conversation. Thanks for coming.